Paul, are you, uh, are you out there? Good morning, everybody. Uh, I think we'll wait probably about three minutes, four minutes to get going. Thanks. Sounds good. Happy Thank New Year, everyone. Yeah, Happy New Year to you, man. Hey, Paul, are you uh, are you out there? Does your audio work? Uh, yeah, I am here. I can try to share my screen and we'll see if that part works. Yeah, if you want to just give that a shot. You know, we usually have 10, 20 people, oh. so I'm, uh, I'm going to give it a couple more minutes, but yep, that's looking good. I can see it. All right. Excellent. Cool. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to stay for the whole meeting. Uh, I I was mistaken about the time oh, okay. uh, of this meeting, so I have a conflict towards the end. But I I think it should be fine. Yeah, I think that's all right. I have uh, two things on the agenda for the meeting today, and uh, so this should be maybe like twenty to twenty to thirty minutes, if that's all right with you. Yep, that's what I plan for. Okay, excellent. I just don't want to be that guy that like takes off after his party. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I think if we plan for like 20 and then we had like five to 10 minutes of questions, uh, that, that would probably be perfect. All right, well, a little bit low on the attendance, but you know we're recording this, so we will definitely send it out to the whole group uh, once we're done. Uh, we'll, we'll get it, kick it off here. So Ben's not gonna be able to make it. Uh, he's got a, a conflict. 
Uh, so I'll be, uh, I'll be chairing it for, for this morning. Um, on the agenda today, we have a couple things. Uh, one is to talk about the open service broker API. So we have Paul Mori from Red Hat. Thank you, Paul, for joining us. And then the second thing we have on the agenda is to have a little discussion about the, the test presentation that we, uh, we saw in the previous meeting a, a month ago. Uh, so at this point, let me hand it over to, to you, Paul, and, and take it from here. All right, thanks a lot, Clint. Um, so, uh, hey everybody, my name is Paul Mori. I work uh, for Red Hat on uh, Open Service Broker API and uh, different things in the Kubernetes space. The most relevant to this one, or to this conversation, is uh, Kubernetes Service Catalog. And I'm going to give a short talk today about cloud native storage and Open Service Broker API. Uh, so, as uh, as far as our agenda for this little talk goes, uh, first I'm going to give an overview of the Open Service Broker API. Um, I'm going to call out the uh, touch points between Open Service Broker API and storage. And then uh, I will give some examples that I know about uh, of cloud native storage type applications that are implemented or integrated with Open Service Broker API. Um, so, the premise of Open Service Broker API and its value proposition is that users and applications need access to uh, usually say services and resources, but since this is the storage working group, I'm also going to call that storage as the thing that they need access to. And uh, those of you that have a, a history of working in large organizations may be uh, familiar with lengthy and uh, sometimes convoluted procurement processes to get new resources or services provision. And the value proposition of Open Service Broker API is that it lets a uh, service provider uh, integrate with multiple platforms uh, with a single API that <laughs> allows users uh, of those platforms to, in an on-demand fashion, provision new instances of a service, uh, where a service is just some capability, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but it allows users to provision new instances of things and to bind those instances to their applications. Um, where, of course, an application might be something at the like user-facing application level, it might be something more infrastructure, uh, it runs the gamut. Um, so, the Open Service Broker API itself defines an HTTP interface between a platform and entities that provide a set of capabilities uh, or services that we call service brokers. And a service broker is a component of a service that implements the Open Service Broker API. So to put that, uh, the, the canon canonical example that we use when uh, discussing this is that um, is that the, uh, say for example, that a service might be a database as a service. The service broker for that service is the thing that knows how to provision new instances of that service and uh, how to create new bindings to instances. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the uh, operations of this API and because uh, in my professional life, I work on the Kubernetes service catalog, which is an integration between Kubernetes and Open Service Broker API. I'm going to do that in the context of uh, Kubernetes service catalog. Um, a brief history lesson before we begin. Open Service Broker API started out as the Cloud Foundry Service Broker API. Uh, it has gone through a couple of uh, major revisions in its lifetime as Cloud Foundry Service Broker API. And in 2016, uh, users of Cloud Foundry were coming to uh, uh, the Cloud Foundry folks and saying, we, we like this idea, we want to be able to use this from other platforms. And uh, at that point, uh, it was decided that, we're, that, that uh, the right uh, future for the API was to become uh, something that was more open than just the Cloud Foundry community. 
And so a new working group was created, uh, API was renamed, and since then we've had folks from Red Hat, uh, IBM, SAP, Google, Pivotal, all working together to uh, evolve this API and make it more platform agnostic. Um, if someone could mute their microphone, uh, there's uh, there's some typing. Hey, Paul, that, that was me. Um, could I get you to hold on just one second? So uh, apparently the uh, the invite, and an invite went out yesterday, and it included mm -hmm. a, a new um, new Zoom call that some of the folks are on, and that's why we have a low attendance. So that was ah, okay. Typing. So I'm you, happy to start over. We're not we're not very far in. If that <laughs> people so, want. To. Yeah, if you could just give me just a minute, I think some of these folks are gonna uh, join over here. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem. And I promise I'll, I'll mute and you won't hear the, uh, the tornado of keys being typed. <laughs> um, hey, Aaron, are you out there? I sure am. How many folks were on the other call? Uh, quite a few, 12. Okay, Hello. cool. There we go. Now we got everyone join, joining. Hey folks, uh, thank you for joining. Sorry for the, uh, the confusion. There was an invite that was sent out yesterday and I was not aware that there was a new Zoom link that was put into it. So we'll make sure that we, we figure that out. Uh, we won't run into that in the future. Uh, so right now we're on the old Zoom invite, which is in the meeting minutes. Uh, today, I, I'm going to be chairing this because uh, uh, Ben isn't able to make it, uh, but we've got a couple items that are on the agenda in the meeting minutes. Uh, the first is that we have Paul Morey from Red Hat, and he's going to be discussing uh, the open service broker and, and how this fits uh, in this cloud native storage world that we've been discussing. Uh, and, and second, we've got uh, an item to discuss the, the test project. So it looks like we're getting a more of a quorum here, which is what I was expecting. So, you know, thank you guys for joining again. Sorry for the confusion. And uh, let me pass it over to Paul to, to kick it off once more and talk about the OSB API. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Mori. I work uh, for Red Hat on uh, Open Service Broker API and different things in the Kubernetes ecosystem. And I'm going to give a short talk today about intersection of cloud native storage and open service broker API. So our agenda today includes an overview of the open service broker API, uh, call out of touch points between storage and open service broker API, and then some examples that I am aware of of cloud native storage uh, type integrations uh, via open service broker API. So the the, the value proposition of Open Service Broker API is that users and applications need access to capabilities like storage, services, and other resources. And um, those of you that have a background working in uh, mid to large size corporations might be familiar with the sometimes lengthy and uh, convoluted processes for uh, uh, requesting that a new resource like a service uh, or a storage volume, getting a chassis racked, whatever, uh, the, the processes around those can be lengthy and convoluted and definitely not uh, in an on-demand type metaphor. Uh, so the value proposition of the Open Service Broker API is that uh, it provides a way for providers to uh, create components that know how to provision new instances of uh, capabilities, which we call services. <clears throat> Could someone mute their microphone, please? Uh, the, the API allows service providers to provision or create components called service brokers that uh, know how to provision new instances of resources and how to create new bindings to those resources. So, uh, the canonical example that uh, we have for explaining this metaphor is a service might be, for example, database as a service. Uh, 
Uh, and the broker that provides that service understands how to provision new instances of that database as a service service and how to create new bindings uh, to that service to be used in applications. So the API itself defines an HTTP interface between a platform and uh, these entities that provide a set of services, which we call service brokers. And a service broker is the component of a service that implements the Open Service Broker API and has the knowledge about how to provision, uh, bind to, unbind from, and deprovision services. So before I proceed, uh, as I mentioned before, I do work on uh, things in the Kubernetes space. Uh, and since that is the, uh, the integration that I'm most familiar with, I will be explaining uh, the Open Service Broker API operations in the context of the Kubernetes Service Catalog. Um, there, uh, there's also a lot of uh, lengthy and, and high quality documentation for folks that have a background in Cloud Foundry uh, for the exact integrations between Cloud Foundry and Open Service Broker API. But we're gonna talk uh, Kubernetes today because that's most, most familiar to me. Um, as I said, the Kubernetes Service Catalog is an integration between uh, Kubernetes and brokers that implement the Open Service Broker API. It is shaped uh, similarly to Kubernetes, and as a user of the Kubernetes Service Catalog, you use API resources that uh, will feel very familiar, hopefully, uh, if you have uh, experience in Kubernetes. And that allows you to, to provision new instances, make bindings to them without having to interact with the AP, Open Service Broker API directly. Um, that's something I want to call out uh, as a point uh, of, of moderate confusion sometimes in, uh, in our community that uh, the Open Service Broker API is really meant for platforms to integrate with rather than end users. So let's take a look at, um, I guess I skipped this slide here. Let's take a look at the op fundamental operations of Open Service Broker API. Uh, the first one and most uh, fundamental is that a service broker has to be able to tell a platform what capabilities or services it offers. Uh, so there is uh, an operation to get a broker's catalog. Um, Central to this discussion is provisioning new resources. So there's an operation called provision, uh, and that is an operation that uh, creates a new instance of, of a service or a resource. To consume that uh, an instance of a resource or a service in an application, uh, there's an operation called bind that will, <coughs> for services that implement it, allow uh, the broker, service broker to return information like credentials, coordinates, uh, quality of service settings for applications that want to use the service. And then provision and bind have symmetric pairs uh, to undo them. So there's an unbind operation and a deprovision operation that remove a binding and deprovision an instance of a service respectively. So in the context of Kubernetes uh, service catalog, which is very, very similar to uh, in, in terms of the generalities uh, of the workflow to use this API in Cloud Foundry, the first step is to add a service broker to the catalog. Um, you do this by creating in uh, Kubernetes service catalog, you create a cluster service broker resource, and um, that tells the service catalog that there is a new broker to consume. So what happens after you create this resource is the, service, the controller backing the service catalog API uh, is watching the API and says, hey, there's a new cluster service broker that uh, I want to consume. I'm gonna go call that, uh, the catalog endpoint, uh, and we do have some uh, unfortunate naming collisions in the space, so uh, I, I usually try to be very good about disambiguating them. If there's a question, uh, please uh, holler and we'll disambiguate it. But uh, the, the catalog controller 
calls the broker's catalog endpoint and gets back a payload from the broker that says, I, ha I present services A, B, and C, and these are the different tiers of those services, uh, and transforms this payload into resources called cluster service class and cluster service plan, and persists those back into the service catalog API server. At that point, uh, a user is able to browse and, and uh, see what services that broker offers in the catalog. And uh, say in the context of our database as a service example, they say, ah, database as a service. Well, I need a database. Um, and they want to provision a new instance of that database. What happens at that point is that they create, create a new service instance resource. And uh, that resource has information about the, uh, the service and tier of that service uh, that the user wants to use. Uh, you can pass parameters to service instances to uh, set knobs that that service allows you to set. The catalog controller handles communicating with the broker and calling the provision operation on that broker. The broker does the work of actually uh, provisioning the resource and reports back status to the caller saying, I either did this uh, or I accepted your request and I'm going to do it asynchronously or I failed to do this, so forth. Uh, the broker uh, does the work of actually provisioning and catalog controller just updates the status of the resource to tell the user your resource is being provisioned or it's already been provisioned, et cetera. Now, when a user wants to bind an instance that they've provisioned of a service to their application, they make another resource called a service binding. And the pattern should be familiar at this point. User creates a resource. There's a controller that backs the service catalog API that detects that a new service binding resource has been created. It calls the binding operation uh, on the broker for that service instance and passes the parameters. Just like with provision, you can pass parameters to bindings. Um, broker handles doing the work of creating that binding and passes back a set of uh, credentials, coordinates, configuration to the caller. And in the case of Kubernetes, that information gets transformed into a Kubernetes secret that uh, users can consume in their applications just like they can with any other type of secret. So next steps that are relevant to this audience are, there are two that I think are, are probably going to be most interesting to folks in this audience. One is the concept of API extensions or generic actions, which uh, are intended to allow broker authors to extend the API dynamically with new actions. Um, the, the canonical use case that we have for this is uh, that this API, as you have noticed, does not have operations for backup and restore. Um, it is very difficult uh, to get folks to agree on the details uh, in a specification like this for what certain actions uh, should entail and what types of parameters they should accept, et cetera. Uh, so I would say perhaps one year, six months ago, the idea started getting traction uh, in our community that there should be a way to add new operations that allow people to prototype uh, new extensions to the API uh, and add capabilities to their services that are possibly unique to their particular service uh, and perhaps implement some other specification that uh, they can link to. But the idea is that uh, you should be able to extend and add new actions to this API without having to go through a lengthy uh, process of uh, actually making a change to the spec. The other uh, thing that I think this audience may find interesting is uh, 
the concept of a binding output schema. Uh, right now, there is no uh, way, no first class way in the API for you as a consumer of a service to know exactly the pieces of information that you will get when you bind to an instance of a service. Um, the binding output schema will al allow brokers to publish a, uh, some sort of schema that says when you bind to this, uh, an instance of this service, you will get these keys that contain this kind of information, these keys, uh, X, Y, and Z key in particular, uh, have sensitive information in them, so you should treat them uh, as if they had sensitive information, and basically uh, expose to the user uh, and allow user interfaces to be created that communicate to the user what type of information they're going to get from a binding. Uh, I have two more short sections of this talk, but I'm going to pause here to ensure that uh, any questions folks have can be answered now. Hey, Paul, this is Basama. Quick question. So is, is the primary goal the definition of essentially services that can be provisioned across different container environments like, or different platforms like Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes and, and others? Or is the goal, is this a Kubernetes-specific, uh, you know, broker? Uh, so that's a really good question. Um, the uh, I I'm sorry. The pause is because I, I started giving this talk before um, before we had s sorted out the uh, the meeting link, and I'm now wondering whether I skipped some content <laughs> uh, about the history of the API. And uh, since those, the memories of the two versions of this talk that I've given uh, in this hour are kind of mixed together, can somebody give me a sanity check? Did I discuss the history of this API here? I, I, I've not seen it. Yeah, not, not okay. too much, Paul. And uh, we've got a, another thing on the agenda too. So I think if we could probably cover whatever we want to within the next five minutes, that would be fantastic. Okay, that, that is very possible. The short answer is that uh, Open Service Broker API is not Kubernetes specific. Uh, it started out as a Cloud Foundry API and uh, users of the Cloud Foundry Service Broker API in 2016 were coming to the Cloud Foundry folks and saying, we like this concept, we wanna use it from other platforms. So what I presented here is just uh, an explanation of the API mechanics in the context of Kubernetes because that's what's most familiar to me. As far as individual brokers go, uh, there are some brokers that uh, that have a uh, that are designed to work in the context of Cloud Foundry, and there are some that are uh, designed to work in the context of Kubernetes, and some that that have an interop story. But there's kind of a spectrum. Does that answer your question? Yes, I, I guess I'm just struck by, you know, I, I, how do you think about the pattern of that Kubernetes provides around custom resources and, you know, essentially the operator controller pattern around those vis-a-vis uh, -vis open service broker? That, that's kind of what I was trying to sort out in my head. Um, okay. Um, I think that might be something to uh, talk about offline. Sure. Uh, if, if you want to send me an email, we can discuss that. Uh, for now, I'm going to get through the rest of the presentation and perhaps that might clear up some questions. Great. So touch points between Open Service Broker API and storage. Uh, there is a notion of volume services in Open Service Broker API. However, uh, this is, this is a, some, a feature that's very Cloud Foundry specific. It predates uh, the time when this API was called Open Service Broker API. And as far as I know, Cloud Foundry is the only platform that implements support for volume services. Um, in the future, uh, changes to the API, like the bind response schema, may make it easier to implement uh, in integrations for storage volumes. But despite uh, this information that I've told you, there are already brokers that 
provide access to uh, uh, different cloud native storage like capabilities already. And when I say cloud native storage, I am not an expert on cloud native storage. But uh, when I say it, what I think of is uh, interoperable storage that you can perhaps find something in your cloud of choice or in your environment of choice that will have parity in some other cloud or environment. So you have some kind of interoper interoperability and portability be between environments. Um, some projects that I am aware of uh, are <coughs> the, there is a, uh, a broker called the Open SDS broker that creates Ceph compatible volumes. Uh, so the, the services it offers are a uh, like volume as a service. So you can provision, provision a new instance of this and get a Ceph compatible volume created for you by Open SDS. Um, there are uh, also a few S3 <coughs> uh, compatible brokers. So there's a, a CNS object broker that creates an S3 compatible object store. Uh, Aaron Boyd on this call is somebody that you can get some more information uh, about that broker from. Uh, there's also a Minio broker, which uh, I am not sure whether this is actively maintained at this point, but it is another broker that creates an S3 compatible object store. And then uh, there is an AWS broker uh, based on uh, Red Hat's Ansible broker that creates S3 buckets uh, using the AWS API. Um, the Minio one isn't necessarily maintained, but we validated it worked. We also worked on that call. This is Aaron. So we can at least get it to someone that's interested. Okay. Um, and that, that is the gist of it. Uh, I think maybe we have one or two minutes left uh, for questions, but I'll defer to Clint on that one. Yeah, that's, that's okay. If you guys have any questions, feel free to, uh, to ask Paul. Yeah, I threw one out to cat, the chat, but I'll say it here. Um, one of the things I'm looking for the entries to have is not just the service name, but sort of its schema. You talked about that, but also the level of service that the instance is providing. So I might have, you know, different object or storage brokers, for instance, that provide different levels of service for the same, you know, Ceph compatible volumes, for instance. Uh, so if I, I typically do uh, presentations on this subject with a little bit more time. One thing that I glossed over, uh, but touched upon, I'm not sure if, it, uh, if I touched upon it enough, but there is a concept of a plan for a service. A service has at least one plan, and a plan is a tier or level of that service. So one thing that you can use plans to represent is different levels of quality of service. So like you may have in the case of a database as a service, the, the bronze plan may be a uh, table space in a multi-tenant database and the platinum plan may be a, a dedicated database just for you with high IOPS and performance characteristics. Perfect. Is that similar to what you're looking for? Yes, perfect. Excellent. Hi, I just want to add that uh, OpenSDS supports block storage, so um, Ceph and also you know, iSCSI block storage in general, and uh, we have plan to support file and object as well in the future. Awesome. All right, cool. So uh, to be respectful of time for we only talked about the tests, uh, I want to close out the questions for now. If you guys have anything else, please uh, send a question to the SWG uh, Google group. And um, you know, I can point Paul to that if something comes in around uh, the open, uh, open service broker API. So thank you, Paul, for presenting. All right, thanks a lot for having me. See everybody. All right. Uh, so next on the agenda is the tests. Um, I think that uh, Brian, are, are you out there? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I think that you filled in some of this agenda. Is that right? With the uh, so uh, we were on the other Zoom channel at the beginning, and I so that was just the intro I was giving. So just okay. saying, here for Q and A, if there was any follow up from previous discussion. 
Great, fantastic. So let's let's get into this. Um, so on here we have Brian to to do be able to answer the question questions about the test. The test is a project that's been presented to the TOC. I think back in. May or June or July of last year. Uh, we just had a presentation on it last week, and or not last week, but the last meeting that we had. Uh, so I think we want to open up to the group to, to ask any questions or make any comments about you know, what they feel about the project and how it relates to the cloud native ecosystem. That's all? you have something? Uh, no, I, I actually submitted a bunch of comments on the pull request itself. Um, so I'm, I'm all good. <laughs> okay. Um, so something that I, I noticed, Brian, when, when, during the presentation is like, I think it, you know, the test that solves an interesting problem in terms of like highly scalable uh, MySQL <laughs> environments. Uh, but the thing that was, was, missing I think a little bit was you know what is the what does it look like to actually deploy like what does it look like to deploy the test with with Kubernetes like you know what is the user experience uh, you know how how automated is the life cycle of having that platform sit within that environment um, and I, I think at the time that the answer was hey that's interesting we should look at it do you have any any perspective on that or, or what you think or how important that may be to to this kind of project Um, yeah, so the, the test has intern, internally to Google runs on Borg, um, much like pretty much everything. And uh, the open source also was made to run on Kubernetes actually very early um, in Kubernetes existence. Uh, so it's actually been running on uh, Kubernetes for years, and I think that's... One, the primary way um, that it's being used outside of Google. Uh, at this point, there is a pretty uh, significant uh, community around, uh, around the tests. Uh, in terms of how automated the life cycle is, I, I think it is, as far as I know, um, fairly automated. There are some things which, like resharding, uh, which may require you know, some amount of uh, operator work, but, uh, you know, routine things like instances being rescheduled just have to be automated because that sort of thing happens in Borg all the time. Um, in fact, Borg, it happens more often in Borg than in uh, Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes cells. Even if you run Kubernetes on preemptables, preemptable VMs or spot instances or something like that, I think the rate of and it's typically less than it would be on board. Um, so the way I see the tests is it's a bridge for applications to cloud native, I and mean, that's how it started. You know, YouTube started with MySQL, and then it just had explosive growth, and then it was acquired by Google and moved on to Borg. Um, and the tests is what made that possible. So. Hey, Brian, one, one question I had about that. So that I saw a KubeCon talk about a MySQL operator, MySQL controller that Oracle's supposedly open sourcing in the next few months. Um, are you guys, is the Vitesse team working with them? Um, or are there any plans there to, for that to support Vitesse? I don't n know if the Vitesse team is, is working with them. Uh, Specifically, I and mean, the the test has a lot of capability. That's not in fact the only MySQL operator, but there are a few MySQL operators. They're pretty simplistic, in my are, opinion. Yes. And the tests, you know, obviously has some more advanced uh, features like sharding, but um, you know, it's also pretty production hardened and heavily instrumented for cloud native. Uh, operation, so you can tell what's going on in terms of the monitoring and the logging and whatnot. Yeah. Um, you know, it has a lot of operator miles on it, and the MySQL operators really can't be compared to that. But it it doesn't actually have any any of the operator patterns in it, though, right? 
uh, well, operator. as some operator patterns and that it's, um, and which operator patterns, I guess. Yeah, I think, it, I think the it, ambiguity here is the word operator. Uh, so I think Clinton's asking about like the CRDs and controllers. Uh, yeah, it doesn't use CRDs because CRDs are brand new. Yeah. Right. But if you fire right, like in the case of a MySQL operator, right, it's going to be a, you know, a pod that controls the lifecycle of everything. In the case of the test, it seemed like it was pretty much a, a manual deployment as you scale out different nodes and it doesn't have integration against the Kubernetes, you know, to act as a controller or an operator. Maybe I'm misunderstanding it, but it, it seemed like a very manual process to do any of the scaling. Um, yeah, I'll follow up with Sugu on what the, the current state of that is. Okay. And, and that's, the, that's the thing that I saw, Brian, with uh, Oracle announcing that they're releasing an, an, a controller and CRDs and everything around MySQL. That's the that was the link that I saw there. That is it worth marrying the two, or there's going to be a separate effort there? Yeah, I think if you had a, a highly scalable, um, but also you know, a, you know where you're integrating and, and acting as a controller, yeah, uh, I think that that's a great solution. Anybody else have any any other? Anything else I want to talk about with the tests? Any other questions? What was the, uh, Brian, what was the, the other project that, um, that you guys were looking at, like the new SQL project that was, that was the, the step after the test for YouTube? Um, well, you, you, you is actually moving to uh, Google internal storage systems. Um, okay. in, in, terms of C, in terms of CNCF, uh, um, Cockroach DB actually presented uh, quite a while ago, over a year ago, um, to CNCF. Right now, there didn't seem to be a lot of interest from them in moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, you know, a spanner-like, uh, open source spanner-like system. Mm -hmm. How so? Are you saying that uh, CNCF didn't have interest for Cockroach, or Cockroach didn't have interest in CNCF? Uh, the latter. Got it. Okay. Uh, how behind the scenes in Google? Like maybe you can or can't talk about this, but the you know the the SQL databases, like the MySQL database that you guys have, like how is that operated? The the cloud service you guys provide. If that's Spanner. Oh, cloud, the Cloud SQL? Yeah. Uh, good question. It does not use the tests. Um, I'm offhand. I don't actually know why that is, but uh, it um, currently has gone through a few iterations. It currently does use MySQL behind the scenes. I don't actually know what the current details are. Okay, fair enough. All right. Um, yeah, I don't have any more questions. Anybody else out there have questions for Brian? All right, if you guys do, you know, feel free to send them to the, uh, the Google group. Um, I think that you know, we'll, we'll follow up with an email to, to discuss like, what the next steps are, or what we, what we feel to get some more opinions on paper, and then uh, we'll deliver that feedback to the TOC with Brian. Okay, thank you. Cool, thank you. All right, so we've got one more thing on the agenda. Um, the next thing is to figure out what other projects that we want to bring to uh, the SWG to talk about. 
so I have a, an agenda item where it's kind of open, so we can either talk about it here, or uh, you guys can fill in projects that you think are gonna be relevant to, to share with the SWG to discuss. And I think that we're open for anything. You know, as you guys saw today, you know, the open service broker isn't something that we're looking to bring into CNCF. Uh, it's something that we just want to be more rounded and more educated about so that we understand you know, the, the landscape and you know, what all the projects are that are out there. And I think it, it helps us better understand you know, what, you know, how projects can be relevant and where they fit. Uh, so if you guys have anything that is storage related, uh, anything that's going to be interesting for the SWG, uh, I'd love to, love to hear about it so that we can put it on the agenda for you know, the upcoming week's meetings. Hey, hey, Clinton, just a clarification. Did you say uh, the open service broker is something that we are not bringing into CNCF? It's, a, it's already a Linux Foundation project. I see. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's under the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and just a quick comment on the open service broker. I, I think one of the ways, um, the primary way as I see it being relevant to storage is that it's potentially in the future, uh, one of the primary ways that higher level storage systems could be consumed by applications in Kubernetes and in other cloud platforms, uh, whether it's object storage or some other storage. Um, you know, there are some very common types of services uh, consumed by applications running in public or private clouds or container platforms like uh, Kubernetes and storage systems, I think, uh, dominate, whether it's, you know, cache caching systems or databases, object stores, key value stores or what, uh, NoSQL stores or whatnot. Um, you know, there are also other services, messaging services and whatnot that you might consume, but uh, storage systems tend to dominate. Yep, I, uh, I totally agree there. And that's why we brought it on today. I think that the, the user experience uh, in what the open service broker, you know, can set up and what uh, Paul was describing today is how I, I think that people will want to be able to consume services. And I think that that's how we can get applications, you know, married to, to their information and to their data. Um, you know, that's when, it, when we think about like this orchestrated storage platform box that, uh, you know, Steve and team had been thinking about, uh, you know, something like Vitess, I don't think that it's an orchestrated storage platform today because it, you know, it doesn't have like, it doesn't fulfill like the controller pattern or the operator pattern. Um, you know, it could, but another checkbox, you know, in that area is to think about, um, you know, whether something actually does integration to OSB. Because if we want to, you know, have a platform that's highly scalable, you know, automatically managed by something like Kubernetes, uh, and then we want to also make sure that there's a user experience which is seamless. Uh, then that means that the OSB or or whatever you know is in that area is important for integration. So, yes, totally agree. All right. Uh, do you guys have any any other projects that you want to put up, put on the agenda? Or, um, yep. All right, if not, we'll, we'll call it a day. Uh, I'm gonna add some stuff to the agenda. Uh, if you guys have anything, please do fill it in and then uh, you know, we'll work on scheduling guests to come on and, and talk about topics. So thank you guys very much and we'll talk to you on the next meeting. Wait, I had a question. Yep. Um, when we were, th this, is, this meeting is a CNCF storage working group meeting, correct? Correct. So when we were at KubeCon, you described um, the plans for three white papers that were going to be done, it sounded like, on a short time frame. Yep. What, what are the plans for those papers? Uh, so we've got the, uh, the three different ones were the uh, Cloud Native Storage Volumes white paper, the Data Services white paper, and the Orchestrated Storage Platforms white paper. Um, I think that they're on pause until we can uh, get the working groups together to, to start working on them and decide on a timeline. Okay, cool. Uh, so on pause for right now. All right, I just, uh, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you guys very much. We'll talk to you next time. All right, thanks.